I'm Glenn McGinnis, and this is Outburst. On the program, should the federal government require digital streaming platforms to include Canadian content? For Canadians should have more Canadian content than American content. You would think that I'd be on the side of that as a Canadian musician, but I'm really not. Because we're losing our identity as a nation, we're being Americanized. So, and I understand also the, the kind of anger and outrage at the government for putting this in place. But first, for kids in Saskatchewan and New Brunswick who wish to change their preferred names or pronouns, in Saskatchewan they must first seek parental consent if the child wishes to do it at school. This follows an initiative put forward by the New Brunswick government with the aim of making a safe and happy learning environment for LGBTQ students. But opponents of this legislation feel it could have the opposite effect and could actually endanger the well-being of LGBTQ students, opening the door to the possibility of self-harm, bullying, or dropping out of school. So we took to the streets to see what you think about this. Our question. Should teachers require parental consent when children under 16 want to change their names or pronouns? I think the parents should be involved up to the age of 16. The kids, uh, as much as they think they know it all, they still need their parents' guidance. When I was 16, I don't think I had the wherewithal to really make a sound decision on that. And I think it needs to be discussed as a family first and then uh, with the teachers. And the teachers should, yes, have a parental consent. Yes. No. Because at 16, you can't even learn to drive until then. They're so young, they need to be, they need to be children first and then figure out who they're, who they are. Yes, I believe they should, yeah. Uh, because as we well know, people under 16, their, their brains aren't fully developed. Their reasoning skills aren't uh, fully developed. So they uh, really don't know uh, they haven't experienced or lived enough to know really what they want. I mean, they, can, they might want to be a pronoun this week and a, a completely different one next week. So, yes, I think parents should have, have control over that. I think so. I think they need guidance. I think they need help. I think they need to be um, informed on the uh, advantages or disadvantages or the outcome of that decision because it is it should it would be a permanent decision. So I think so. So I think no, because we know that uh, queer children are uniquely at risk for uh, abuse in their homes. Um, being queer and being vulnerable in any way uh, increases a child's risk of being abused by a parent. Um, when a school discloses that kind of information to a parent, it may open up a child to abuse. And if a child uh, under 16 doesn't feel comfortable sharing that information with their parents, there's probably a good reason. And that child probably knows best how their parents are going to respond. It's up to, the, I think it's up to the parents, you know. But, uh, you, you know, children are easily manipulated. They're the most, you know, vulnerable in our society, really, to, to outside influence because they're, they're not an adult. They don't have the experience or the, you know, critical thinking skills yet to actually understand what they're being taught. I'm sort of torn on that because there might be other issues at home that we don't know about. And uh, so I'm sort of torn on that part where it, the teachers have to do what they, the child wants. But as far as the teacher informing the parents, I'm still on the fence about that one. I don't see the harm of a 14 or 16 year old. There must be a million things that the 14 or 16 year old is already doing that their parents are maybe never going to find out until they're an adult. And it doesn't make any sense to, I think, I think it's a greater harm to uh, bring the, to force them to, to let their parents know, because I mean, I've worked in child protection. I've worked with parents and you know, they're well-meaning, but you know, I don't, they, they're going to find out eventually. It's not like the person can use his pronoun. He can't formally change his name until he's an adult. So it's just the school, as far as I can see, supporting that person in that community. And then it's that person's choice. So, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think that you should be forced to. 
I don't know. I think each uh, generation, they have their own thing, right? Uh, it was the flower power at one point. It was the rock, metallic, and like each generation, they have their own way to explore and express themselves. I don't think kids are harming, causing harm to themselves by if like uh, someone's daughter or son say, I want to go by they, them. I don't think if that's one thing they want to explore, it's not harming them. And I, I am as the parents of two kids, I have no problem with that. Absolutely. Uh, no, I think they should be called whatever their birth certificate says, and that's the way it should be until they're 16 and the right state of mind and appropriate age to change. Before that, they're wishy-washy. And yeah, the media can also change that too. They watch television, they watch this stuff, and they see a program that they like or somebody that's popular, and then all of a sudden they don't think they know who they are and they want to change that, but that could change in a year. So they should obviously be the right age, for sure. The legislation on the books that requires parental consent, I, I, I know that they're trying to do the right thing, but I don't think that it's necessarily a black and white thing, as the legislation suggests. Alternatively, uh, when school boards say that things should be kept secret from parents, I don't think that's the right approach either. I, I think, as with many things, the real answer is somewhere in the middle. And it's frustrating to see that neither side of the equation wants to find that middle. They just want to stake their ground and yell at the other side. I don't think it serves the kids or anybody else. I think it's a discussion that parents should have with their kids, absolutely, because uh, it's their children. Um, but I'm sure you recall growing up as a teenager, we always rebel against our parents at some age, right? We don't always tell our parents everything. Um, I think uh, a child does have rights as well, but up to a certain point, parents should be involved with these kinds of decisions. Unless you've been hiding under a rock, you're probably more than familiar with the housing crisis occurring in this country. For millions of Canadians, especially young people, the dream of home ownership has been inching away with each passing year with no relief on the horizon. A recent study done by the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corp says that we must build 3.5 million housing units to get to 2004 affordability levels, a task which would not easily be attainable. So we sent our cameras out to ask Canadians if they feel home ownership is something still within reach or is it too late? Our question. Is it realistic to expect all Canadians could become homeowners? Right now, I don't think that, that'll ever happen. I think the price of houses here is absolutely ridiculous. Um, they're not given any support for people. Uh, like if you're a single person, and you try to save, you're going to be saving all your life to be able to be a, a homeowner. And I think that unless they change situations and start helping the people, it's never going to happen. They should have more f affordable houses for, you know, every, every person of, of different uh, salary bases. The actions that have been taken by the government thus far have really not had an impact on the accessibility of affordable housing. Um, I think that under this current model, no. But, it, you know, many groups have put forward ways to make that possible. Um, I know that ACORN uh, has been organizing in Calgary and has put forward uh, policy proposals for the municipality to put forward, and they've made some commitment to doing so. So I, I believe that it's possible, um, but under our current uh, model, I don't know that it's likely. No, not even close. Uh, real estate has become completely unaffordable. And... It's tough to really pin why, but you no, know, certainly there is a large amount of immigration and only so much space. So we're very limited in terms of where people want to live. You know, 90% of the entire population is very close to the U.S. border. There's basically five, six major cities that everyone wants to live in. No one wants a two-hour commute. So there's a big supply-demand imbalance. Oh, absolutely not. Um, the way the interest rates are going, it's hard enough at uh, minimum wage to even afford your own rent, let alone a set of money aside for uh, the future. Whether it's a, a buying a home or even getting further ahead. Very unlikely, especially with how much more expensive groceries are getting. Life expenses are getting so much more expensive and you know, uh, our wages aren't increasing. Gas prices are crazy right now and the wages are still the same, you know, I don't feel like 
everyone can become a homeowner in these days. It's, it's very hard. I think it's out of reach for, well, particularly now, uh, for a lot of people. And perhaps for not just recently, but for a longer period of time, owning a home is expensive. And uh, just with the, the incomes that there are, the cost of everything, like how much money can people reasonably be expected to salt away? It, I don't think it's I don't think it's necessarily a something people should expect to be able to do. But it, at the same time, I would say it ought to be perceived as being in reach, which right now it's not for a lot of people. No, at this rate, no, because inflation is just so high. But also, I don't think there is a lot of um, education around how to become a homeowner. Um, there's very little that people are taught in regards to budgeting. And um, a lot of people get in debt first before they even realize um, how to budget. And they kind of realize a little too late. <laughs> so budgeting is a big problem, I think, when it comes to home ownership in general. For now, I think it's very hard. <laughs> like for now, it's hard. But like if you said like within 10 years, like maybe, but like for now, like recently, I don't, I think it's hard. But do you think 10 years and beyond that might happen? Yeah, I think so. It's a big country. Yeah. It should be happen because it's a big country. Okay. What do you have to say? Oh, I think that's unrealistic in every country and especially with the circumstances now we have the war in Ukraine which is consuming like uh, the global economy and it's inflation everywhere. I know people are complaining and affected by the inflation here in Canada. I'm one of them, believe me. but. I have relatives in Germany, I have relatives in Turkey. It's way worse in some part of the world. And it's, I, I think, you know, I think we would need more time to recover. And I don't actually think home owning is for everyone. No, no, I mean, interest rates are too high. Housing prices are too high. Uh, rent is too high. You're gonna see a lot more homeless people and a lot of people living with each other more so than people owning their own homes, I think. No. Not everybody needs to be a homeowner. Not everybody wants to be a homeowner. At some point in your life, you don't need to be one. It is okay to be living in an apartment if you have two children. A lot of countries live that way. It's fine. I think it's unrealistic to expect that because uh, like the way Canada is structured, uh, it's a pretty spread out country. Uh, the way zoning laws are here, uh, it's like, most of Canada is zoned for single family homes and I don't think it's sustainable that a country of 40 million will have single family homes all around and like homeowners all around unless something drastically changes how Canada builds homes. I don't think it's realistic. I know myself. I used to be a single mom and I know myself. I couldn't survive today and I have a government job. I just couldn't do it. So. No, it's very sad that people trying to buy houses, young people, um, I, I, I can't see them being able to afford it. Who was the first Governor General to serve during the reign of Queen Elizabeth II? George Vanier, Vincent Massey, or Roland Michener? Vanier, Massey, or Michener? I'm going to guess Massey. I'm going to say Michener. Michener? No? I want to go with Vanier. I'm going to say Michener. Vanier, Massey, Michener. M Michener, I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I believe I'm going to go with Massey. I think it's Vanier. Vanier. Massey. Vanier. Vanier, Massey, Massey or Michener? I'm going go with Massey. The answer is Massey. Oh, I lost. Let's You're go. a genius. Let's go. You're a good man. <laughs> Vincent Massey served as Governor General of Canada from 1952 to 1959. He is the first Canadian Governor General to serve as Vice Regal Representative under Queen Elizabeth II and welcomed the Queen and Prince Philip to Canada during her inaugural visit as Queen of Canada in 1957. With Massey's appointment as Governor General in 1952, he became the first Canadian to serve in the role. Before that, all his predecessors have been born elsewhere in the British Empire or British Commonwealth. Every Governor General since Vincent Massey 
has always been a Canadian citizen. Although it's not on the radar for as many people these days, according to public health officials, the threat of COVID-19 and new variants continues to loom over the fall winter season as school has resumed classes and indoor gatherings will become more common as the weather gets colder. But with restrictions long since being lifted and life seemingly back to normal, a portion of the population may feel getting a shot is no longer necessary. So will you be rolling up your sleeves for another booster or will you be taking a pass? Our question. Will you be getting one of the new COVID-19 vaccines this fall? I will not. Why? Well, I got the two first shots and they actually made me sick. So everything after, I mean, I got COVID with the shot. So, uh, you know, it's not preventing you from getting COVID. So I don't, I just don't believe in it, but I mean, it, I took the two, first two and I got sick with those. And then after I didn't take any, I never got sick again. No. Why? Well, I have had three and I made the decision after having three that I'm not going to have any more. Um, that's really all I want to say about that. Yeah. I mean, do you feel you don't need it? Has it made you sick? Like in what way? No, it hasn't made me sick. I had a kind of a rough reaction to the second one. Um, not much reaction at all to the first and to the third. The thing that I don't know whether it's protected me or not. I mean, I, I don't have any way to quantify that. The thing that made me encouraged to take the vaccine in the first place, although I'm not nor normally inclined to take things which I might be experimental or prepared in a hurry, uh, was that I really believed that it would it would end the pandemic and it would it would reduce or eliminate transmission. We were assured that that was the case, and it wasn't. So uh, I don't really want to take any more of it. No. Why? I was. I only got the first one because I wanted to go to a sports event. Then I found out if you waited long enough, you wouldn't have actually had to use them to go in. I trust my body more than I trust some of this fast science. If someone's telling me that we don't know the effects of long-term use of marijuana, I'm going to use that same point on how I don't know long-term effects on COVID vaccines. I really didn't give it lots of thoughts, but I probably won't. Why? I think it's getting less uh, I don't, aggressive and I think it, it's just like a very bad cold and I don't think I'm going to get the vaccine. Okay, and what about you? Well, I think I'm going to get it. Okay, why? I think it's safer. You think it's safer? Yeah. So why do you think it's safer? Like in general, in case like it's like in the the amount of the people increase again for having COVID, like I will be safer. Like, yeah. I honestly haven't thought about it. Um, I I don't f personally feel the need to. Um, I did get two shots when uh, it was all going down initially. Um, probably, uh, it's something I guess I need to think about now. <laughs> Uh, if there's a new booster out, I think I'd like to hear the reasons why it would be beneficial to me. And I think I've this whole time put my trust in people who are experts in areas that I'm not. And I'll continue to do that. Oh, sure. Well, I've had three so far, so I'll keep it up. I'm immune compromised. So, yeah, I'm getting it. I would because I work with the public, but it also depends on the amount of research that's been done on it. And if it's more of a local vaccine or international vaccine where it comes from uh i haven't decided yet but most likely i will uh, when i get my flu shots i'll get the other ones too what uh, like it makes sense to get it i don't want to get sick like even if i get sick i wouldn't get as sick as i would have otherwise uh yes i will be getting it because of the fact that i'm i'm up there in age and uh and I'd like to live, be around longer for to see my friends and family. Yes, I will. I've had everyone so far and I need to protect myself as much as possible. I can't take the flu shot, so I go with the COVID. I've already gotten it. Uh, I've never had COVID and I would prefer not to have COVID because I have many other medical issues going on and COVID would probably kill me. <laughs> I've had two before of the COVID. Just to be safe, if, it, if, it's safe, if it's safe, who knows, right? But you got to take that chance. Yeah. 
Now to try to look after yourself as much as you can. Absolutely not. Because I don't believe in it. Because what COVID is, and when COVID came out, it was a money grab. I want to keep myself and my community safe. Um, there are people around me every day who are immunocompromised, or maybe those who haven't got their vaccine. They're vulnerable in that way. So I, I think that it's a, a community obligation to keep each other safe. Absolutely not. Uh, I wouldn't have got the first vaccine, only I was living in Canada and my father was dying in Ireland. And I gave up my job to go back and take care, take care of him before he passed away. And that was the only reason I got vaccinated was because I had to get vaccinated before I was allowed to travel. So uh, I have a few friends who's had uh, a lot of reactions to the vaccine. Um, and I'm not going to get fact. I'm not going to get another vaccine. Uh, I have two two brothers and a sister who never got vaccinated or vaccinated, and I think they made the right choice. Yes, pretty much. Yeah. Well, despite my my uh, challenges I have with big pharma, and despite it's not necessarily a perfect solution, I I don't believe that. I believe it's more more useful for me. And not only that, how about everybody else around me? How about the rest of the public? You know, whatever happened, I'm not my own little individual entrepreneur at war with everyone who has some kind of special freedoms and special person. I believe the opposite. I believe we could have done a lot better with COVID if we all had a pulled it pulled together. Back in April, Bill C-11, also known as the Broadcast Streaming Act, received royal assent becoming law. This new bill amends the Broadcasting Act and requires digital streaming platforms such as YouTube, Netflix, and Disney Plus, just to name a few, to feature more Canadian programming and invest millions more in Canadian content. Although there's been some pushback by the digital content providers, the goal on the side of the federal government is to ensure that Canadian content will be provided on these platforms for years to come. So we took to the streets to see what you think about this. Our question. Should the federal government require digital streaming platforms to include Canadian content? Definitely. Because we're losing our identity as a nation, we're being Americanized. Not much of an opinion on that, but I would say no, because it's too much of a like intrusion into private businesses, I would feel. I think it's always wise to have uh, your country's content played in your country. I think it's uh, good to champion within and that can help industries build in your own country. Um, do I think it should be just your country's content? I think that that would be a miss as well, but a mixture of both can't go wrong. I don't think so. I don't think so because then again, it's going to be controlled which platforms are being presented. And if people want to go to see Canadian information, then they, they, can, they will find a way to get that information. Uh, that's a tough question. I mean, I suppose they have a free and open market, so I don't think they should force anybody to do that, no. I think uh, if you can pay to have your whatever it is you might want on these streaming services, fine. If you can't, well, too bad. If they want to get revenue from Canadians, they should be willing to put our content on their service. That's how I feel about it. I don't know all the dynamics behind it, but uh, it seems only fair. No. Well, we do try to protect Canadian content in most media. And I agree with that. You know, we're a small country right next to a big giant and we'd just get swallowed if we didn't. But <laughs> there has to be some sort of limit. I mean, I think, yes, I, I understand why the government uh, put that type of law in place. I think that protecting Canadian creators is important. Um, and I understand that an, that an important element of the protection is a bilingual component which is obviously very important. Um, I think that uh, I, I think that it's it's difficult to go up against a multi-billion dollar corporation um, with seemingly endless resources in that respect. Um, so, and I understand also the the kind of anger and outrage at the government for putting this in place. But um, I think the anger is kind of misdirected at the government when it maybe should be directed at these corporations. But um, yeah, it's, it's a hard, 
it's just a hard issue. I'm not sure. It's a great question, and it's a very difficult issue because clearly the power is in the hands of the social networks. You know, the, the Metas and the Facebooks, Googles, extremely powerful. And they, quite frankly, can be fine and very profitable without Canadian content. However, I do recognize that that's come at the expense of the traditional publishers, the news channels, the local people covering the news, which is important. We need to have money going to local organizations to cover that. So it's a difficult issue. And I don't really have a solution and how to balance that, but I think something must be done. I'm not sure if the government figured out the right way to do it, but I believe they're on the correct path in terms of addressing it. I think again, to a certain extent, um, certainly there's a lot of fantastic content that is available that is Canadian driven and Canadian focused. Um, but I think it is also important to have a broad spectrum as opposed to something that is strictly linear to just Canadian content because there are so many people here in Canada that benefit from having um, resources and, and things from their home countries that are now living here. I think that would be wonderful. I'm not sure that it should be a governmental like um, mandatory, but I think it would be great. Canada is a great country and I think the more people get to know it, the better. Before coming to Canada, I always thought, oh, it's snow and no, it's not that. It's lots of good things going on here. I would think, yeah, that would be great. So what do you think? Yeah, me too. You Same. Think? Yeah, yeah, it should what? be. But same, like I think it would be great to know more about Canada and like like everything. Yeah, well, absolutely. Absolutely. I think a, a lot of YouTube should only be Canadian content. And then some, you know, for Canadians should have more Canadian content than American content. That way we know what's going on here and not abroad. You think Canadian content should be predominant on YouTube? Absolutely. Absolutely. We're Canadians. We should know all the information first. As someone who's a musician by profession, uh, you would think that I would be on the side of that as a Canadian musician, but I'm really not. I, I don't think that requirements of that kind, quotas, bans, all of those things really serve anybody. They look good. Uh, it's a way of the government saying, look at us, we're doing something about it. But I don't think that it really changes the reality for creative people. Thanks for watching this episode of Outburst on CPAC. If you have any comments about this show or any other show, you can find us on social media. You can also find us on our website at www.cpac.ca. I'm Glenn McGinnis, and on behalf of my colleagues at the Cable Public Affairs Channel, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.